Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Articulate Storyline workshop. These are the workshops where you vote on what we build. And it looks like today, let's see, a custom menu with completion tracking is the winner. So we vote with the polls tab at the bottom. And it makes sense that the custom menu wins today because at the last session we did like this, that was a very close contender. So I'm glad to see that you all showed up and that we're going to dive into this today. Um, if, if what you voted for didn't win, it will be an option uh, at the next session we do like this, which will likely be in two weeks. So don't worry, we will get to it. Now, this custom menu will give us a really good opportunity to dive into variables and conditions as we usually do with projects like this. So hopefully it will help um, intermediate users get more comfortable using variables. And if you're a beginner, we will move quickly. This recording will be available as soon as this session is complete. So maybe just watch through. And if you want to try to recreate it, do so afterwards. But let's dive into it here. So you can follow along, but again, we will move fast. So I'm going to share my screen and we will get started. Yeah, you can, if you're, if you're new, you can attend. Just hang out, see what we're doing and pick up what you can. Let me bring my chat over to the other window. Okay, so here's what we're working with. So I have, oh, and let me just, sorry, I need to change my resolution so I can actually see the chat over there. So give me one minute. So we have storyline opened up here, as you can see. Okay, and I can see the chat, so we're in good shape. So with storyline open, I actually went ahead and downloaded a few graphics that I want to use for this custom menu. I was doing that right beforehand. So I have this illustration pack here. I really like these colorful illustrations, so I think it will work for us. And I just picked out a few of them. So I got these from this site, getillustrations.com. This is a paid bundle, but you can see they have so many bundles here. Um, if you click into any of these, you'll see a ton of options. Uh, and, and, I, and you can have access to like every single bundle for like 200 bucks. So if you do want to follow along, you can just use Storyline's built-in graphics or icons, or you can use this really cool site called storyset.com. All of these illustrations are free with attribution, and this used to be called Free Pick Stories. So you've probably heard me talk about this before. But just wanted to give you a heads up on those. So let's dive into this. So I'm going to, I opened up Storyline and I started a new project. So here we are. Now I'm just going to double click on this slide to bring us into slide view here. I think the concept, this is going to be, we're, the, the content won't be important here. We're focusing mainly on the functionality. But the first thing I want to do is I don't want it to be this like desktop, like kind of tall aspect ratio. I want this to be more of a widescreen experience, I think. So to change that size of this canvas, so to speak, or of the slide itself, we can go to the design tab up at the top, and then we will go to this story size option right above where it says setup. Okay, so here's where we can change that aspect ratio. I want to go with the 16.9 aspect ratio, and we want to go with 1280 width. So 1280 by 720 is a pretty good aspect ratio to go with. It'll look great on mobile devices because it should fill that screen when you're in landscape mode. And, and this is also the same aspect ratio as videos if, you, if you're new to aspect ratios. So you see when we press OK here, now we have more of this video, YouTube video sized canvas. And that's what we wanted. So let's add a title now. So I'm just going to go to the Insert tab and select Text Box. Another option, which I'll show you here, is you can just mouse over where you want the text box to go and then press Control key on Control T on your keyboard. And it will create a text box right where your mouse pointer is at. Someone shared that tip in one of the first Storyline workshops and I thought that was really cool. So I'm going to call this, let's call it Devlin's Guide. Let's call it Devlin, Devlin Peck's Guide to Life. Okay, this is, this is my guide to life here. Again, content isn't important, <laughs> but we're just having fun with it. Um, next up, I have this text box selected. I'm going to the Home tab, and I'm going to change this font. It's Open Sans by default, but we want to change this to Futura Bold. Change this to any font you'd like. This is something I have through Adobe Creative Cloud. This is just the font I use for my brand, so 
Just change it to any, your favorite font, I would say, if you're following along. And this font size, let's try 48 and see how that looks. I think that looks good enough. So we will have this up here. Maybe we want this to be, actually, I think that's a decent size. Let's add my name to the dictionary. Okay, I guess not actually. So that, that that's fine. And now I'm gonna make another text box beneath this. I'm gonna just actually click it and drag it down. I'm holding down the shift key. Oh, whoops, let's undo that. I'm holding down the shift key so that the, it stays aligned. You can see on the left and right that kind of pink purplish line. Um, and now I'll hold down the control key so that when I let go, it makes a copy of this text box. So that's something I do a lot. Instead of just making a new text box and aligning them, I just kind of drag it, hold down control so that when I drop it, it makes a copy. So you can see again, I'm dragging it. I'll hold down that control key on my keyboard. I let go, it makes another copy. Okay, so that's an approach I like to use. This is obviously way too big. We want this to be like a, a subheading. So I'm going to make this size 24. And we want to get some more contrast in the font weight. We don't want it to be really bold like this. So I'm going to change this to just Futura PT book. There we go. We have some contrasts now. And, and I think that this page will, it's going to double as our title screen and our, our menu page. Okay. We're going to have like a nice visual menu here instead of just like something boring where it's on the left with, with text. You will be able to use the same uh, programming that you learn in this session to program a menu like that, but we're going to make some ni a nice visual menu with like buttons that you select to explore. But okay, so let's say select each button below to explore the content. So this is just like a little instruction. I'm going to actually move it over a pixel or two just so it looks more aligned. There we go. Okay, I see, I see, it seems like everyone's with me so far. Feel free to stop me and ask a question if you have any while we're doing this. But we have our heading. Now I think we need some actual buttons that people can select to explore the content. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this insert tab and let's insert a shape. And as you guys know, if you've been here before, we start simple and we're going to get progressively more complex. So hopefully there will be something here for everyone. So we're going to go to that insert tab and we will insert a shape. And I want to insert just a rectangle. So I will click on that right here. I want to make sure that it's aligned with where this is starting over here. So let me just kind of draw how big I think this needs to be. I'm gonna move it down now, holding down shift to keep it aligned on the left. I want there to be equal white space above and below this button. And let's see how this is going to be distributed here. This, this looks like a decent size. I could probably actually even make this a little bit wider. So let me do that. Probably make it a little bit taller. I think that's looking good. We don't want this to have a fill. So what we're going to do is we're going to make one of these buttons first. And once that looks good, we're just going to um, copy and paste them so that we have three and then we'll swap out the text and the image. So we don't want our button to have a fill. So I'm going to go with this rectangle selected, I'm going to go to the Format tab, and I'm going to make this fill no fill. So we're going to get rid of that fill, and this outline I want to be, well, let's actually make it my brand, the, the black, the, it's like a very light, like a lighter black than usual. So I'm actually going to change that for each of these text boxes. I will select them both. I do that just by holding down the Shift key and then selecting the other one so that they're both selected. And now on the home tab, I'm going to click on this drop down next to font color. And I'm just going to change it to 1F, 1F, 1F. That's like my brand color. You can, you can barely notice the difference, but it's a slightly lighter black. And I'll do the same thing with this rectangle. I'm going to go to the format tab. Once I have that rectangle selected, I'll go to shape outline, more outline colors. And then I'll, I have that actually saved right here as a default. Um, we can see now this stroke is like way thinner than the stroke up here. So we want to be consistent with our design elements, of course. We don't like, this contrast is good, but if everything is contrasting from everything around it, it just starts to look a little bit chaotic. So as I build, I'm always thinking about these design elements. So what we need to do is we need to make this shape outline stroke a bit thicker. 
So once again, in the Format tab, we're clicking on this drop down next to Shape Outline. We are hovering over Weight, and let's see how each of these look. I think three is looking a little bit better. So let's go with that three pixel weight. Next up, uh, or actually we, let's, four might even look better here. Let's see. Okay, this, is, this stands out a little more. This is a bit bolder, I like this. So now I want to ensure, insert an image into this shape. I want, like I said, I want these to be nice visual buttons. So from the insert tab, I'm going to picture. I'm going to just click that. It will open up my file browser and let's do examine. So our three steps here will be like examine, explore, and connect, I think. That's my guide to life, okay? <laughs> Again, I was just trying to think of words that went well with some of these images that I liked. I'm looking at this, well, let's just see. So I'm trying to get this centered. I have, the, I have their feet on the bottom, so that's good. It probably would look better if this was against the side, but I don't know if, let's see. So I'm just being nitpicky here, getting the pixels right, as you can see. Okay. Kind of looks like she's like, like you can't really see the bottom of this button when I zoom out, which I'm not loving. Let's see. Maybe I'll just keep it like that. Okay, that looks good. And now we're going to just draw this same text box here. I'm going to drag this where I want it. I'm holding down the control key and now I will let go. And let's label this button. This one will be called Explore. And, we can, and since this is like a, the button title, we can probably make this the bold font as well because we want this to stand out. So thinking about hierarchy. When I'm dragging this right side out, I'm holding down the control key on my keyboard so that it drags out the left side by the same amount so that it still say, stays centered. That's a nice approach instead of having to like, oh, and now let's center the text right here on the home tab. And I'm actually thinking this might look better if it's a bit bigger here. I don't really want to have three different text sizes going on here. So let me just see how this looks. Um, I think this is looking okay. What are you all thinking? Nesma, I see you're saying your internet connect connection isn't that great right now. But yeah, this recording will be available as soon as the session is over. And I'll upload this to YouTube two weeks from now. All right, we're looking good. If anyone has any questions at any point, just let me know. Again, I don't love having all these different text sizes going on. Let's see if I make this size 36. Whatever, we'll, we'll be fine, it's, it's looking good enough. Okay, move this up maybe a little bit. So now that we have this one button, it's looking good. I think we want to recreate this. So I'm going to just, well, we can group this. So you see how I just selected all three of these elements? Another way to do that is on the timeline. So you see, I can just click on these on the timeline. If I select this top one, hold down the shift key and then select this, this rectangle, it will select all of these the same exact way. As a button, will it be group or added to state layer? So Caitlin, the way I'm going to make this button interactive is just by adding a hotspot over it. So I'm going to make this interactive just by adding a hotspot. We're not going to do that yet though. And I'm sorry, I need to replace my mouse. Like when, I'm, when I drag, it kind of just like stops the drag mid drag. So I need to fix that. But we're, we're not going to make it interactive yet. First, let's just get the slide layout looking good. So once again, I'm, I'm holding down shift. I'm selecting all of these things. I'm just going to drag it now. I'm holding down the control key and I'm going to drop it. And, and let me just press control G now to, to group it. So if you're on a Mac, it should be command G. So you'll see once I press control G, this is going to look like one shape. So ready, set, control G. And now it looks like one thing. You see, this is a group, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing over here just to, you'll see why in a second. So I'm gonna group that as well. And now instead of having to select all those things all over again, I'll just drag this out and hold, hold down control. And now there's a copy. Now you can see the spacing in between these isn't consistent and that's a problem. We want to make sure that these are evenly distributed across the page. So watch what I'm going to do here now that we have all three of these. Now, so I want to select each of the groups. So I'll do this on the timeline. I'll hold down shift and I'll select the, the top one. So all three of these are selected. 
And now we're going to use these distribution tools that are built into Storyline. So I'm going to go to the Format tab. And this, this option right here in the Arrange and Align section, there's this Distribute Horizontally option. So what that will do is all of the elements you have, it will make sure that there is even space in between each of them. So I click on that. This thing moves over. It looks a bit better. But there is one problem with this, OK? Like the amount of space over here on the left is smaller than the amount of space over here on the right. And I don't like that, OK? I want this to be consistent. So one, one thing I could do is I can group, select all of these. I could group them. And then I can center them all. So now there's equal space on the left and the right. But now the problem is that this left one isn't aligned with the text above it. OK, so I'm going to, oh no, storyline. OK, guys, our groups are broken. As, oh, here we go. Storyline acts up sometimes, but we're good. So what I'm going to do, I want this to be aligned here. Let me get that perfect. I'm going to drag this down. This one, come on. So what I'm going to do to get equal space on the left and right of these is a, is a trick that some of you may have seen me use before if you've been here um, for long. So I'm going to insert a rectangle over here to the left so that I can see how much space really is between those two items. OK? So now that I have that rectangle, it's perfectly lined up with the edge of the slide in the box. I'm going to make a copy of that rectangle over here on this side. OK, so everyone, everyone see how I'm doing that? So now I, can, now I can just move this one over so that it has that same amount of space in between it and the edge of the slide. OK, so those are just like little helper shapes to make sure we get, we get that even. And now I can use that same trick I used earlier where we distribute them horizontally. And that one looks like it was already centered. And that would be another way to do it, too. We could, we could just center that. It's the same thing. OK, so we're looking good. I could probably add a, my logo over here in the top right just to let me do that actually to add a bit more balance. Will take me one second. But you see, like I didn't like having this like white space like just empty over there with like it was leaving it kind of unbalanced. So I'm just sizing it in relation to this text. Now we'll move it over here and let's align that with the edge of this. So we still have some dead space here, but you can see it's kind of keeping things a bit more connected. And we can probably move these down a little bit. Well, actually, this is fine. This is fine. We can actually probably move this down a little bit. So now we have three buttons that say the exact same thing. That's not going to work for us. So let's change the text first. So it will be explore, connect, and oh, this one's going to be examine, actually. Examine, connect, and explore. OK. So I can actually ungroup these now. So to ungroup something on Windows, you do, instead of Control-G, you do Control-Shift-G. OK? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold down Control. I'm going to hold down the Shift key. And then I'm going to press the G key, as in group. And you see now, now it just breaks back apart into individual elements. I'm going to do the same thing for this one, because now we can just right click on the image. And we can select replace picture, picture from file. OK, so that's going to keep the aspect ratio. Well, it's going to keep the width constrained. But if the aspect ratio is different, we'll have to do some resizing. So let's select that option. And this one will be connect. OK, so let's center this one in this box. Probably move it down a tad. OK, looking good. And explore here. We need to replace this one as well. Picture from file. And this one will be explore. This guy's having fun. So you see, I'm just doing a, a few manual adjustments once I get them in here. Looks like this one actually needs to be maybe moved up a bit. OK. OK, so here we go. We have our buttons. Very colorful. I think it's looking cool. Uh, I see Danielle is asking how you how you get access to Articulate for training purposes. They have a 60-day free trial, so you can just start your trial, and then you can use the tool to learn it. Oh, and I'm sorry. I kind of have been taking that for advantage with the zooming. I'm holding down the control key on my keyboard and then scrolling in and out with my mouse wheel. 
I think if you're on a laptop, you can probably pinch and zoom, I would imagine. Federica is asking where I got the, the images from. I covered this at the beginning, but it's a site called getillustrations.com. Uh, these are paid, but you can use them from also storyset.com. These ones are all free with attribution. But these are, this is the actual one I was using, the contemporary illustrations pack. They look really nice. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. Okay. So this is looking good. Again, I, I kind of... I think I want to move this down a little bit again. I'm the, the, All of the visual design stuff, this is stuff I would figure out in Adobe XD, but I don't think we have enough time for me to like do all of that iteration in X XD in these sessions. So we have our UI figured out here. I think this is looking good for our purposes. So let's go ahead and make this interactive now. Well, let's actually tidy up our, our scenes. So on the left here, let's call this home. So where it says untitled slide in this scenes uh, toolbar over here, I'm double clicking that and I'm just going to change it to say home. Okay. So we, we, that, that's changing the title of this individual slide. Now I'm going to click on the story view out here and I want to change the title of this scene. So I'm going to double click on the scene title and once again, I will call this home. We have a home scene with a, with a slide in it called home. I want to make a, a different scene now for each one of these like paths of content that you can explore. So we need to make a scene called examine, a scene called connect, and a scene called explore. So let's do that. So I'm just going to right click anywhere out in this gray area and select new scene. And then once I'm just double clicking into the scene title and I will call this one examine. And you know what? This again, instead of doing all of this Instead of making each scene up front, we're going to use the same approach that we used for the button. Okay, and this is a pattern I, I use all the time in Storyline to avoid rework. Instead of making each one of these scenes now and then trying to build the same thing in each of them, we're just going to create one scene first and then we can duplicate that scene and reuse some of the programming that we're going to build. So let's just do it for the examine one first. So now that we've created the scene, we can add a we can make this interactive. So we can insert, we're, go we're going to the insert tab and we're selecting a hotspot. I'm going to select this rectangular hotspot and then you can just draw a rectangle over this button. So if you're new to hotspots, these things are invisible to the users, but they make it so that you can add interactions. So let me just, well, we'll see in a second. Okay, I see people are helping each other in the chat. Yes, Dorian, I do I do usually do my layout and prototyping in XD, but we're just doing it in Storyline since this is a Storyline workshop. But I'll have a video coming out about how I use XD sometime soon. Okay, so yeah, this hotspot watch, if we preview this slide, you're not going to see that green rectangle there. That's only there for us so that we can make it so that when someone clicks that hotspot, for example, it will do something. So invisible to the user. So with that hotspot selected now, we're going to select this create a new trigger icon in the triggers panel. So again, if you are a beginner, triggers are how you make things interactive. So I'm going to select this um, create a new trigger button and the action, I want this to jump to a slide. We can also do jump to a scene, but let's just do jump to a slide because if we have enough time, I, we can build on this later. So we're going to jump to a slide, not the next slide, but we're going to jump to this untitled slide in the examine scene that we just created. So does everyone see how, how we're doing that? So when someone clicks on this hotspot, we're gonna to jump to that untitled slide in that new scene we created. And the reason it already has when the user clicks hotspot one is because we had that hotspot selected when we created the trigger. So then it kind of default fills in this when these when properties and clicking is always that default. Okay, so I'm going to press okay now. Let's go, so now you can see this one's ordered after that because an interaction on this slide will bring you into this next scene. So let's double click this slide title and let's name this one examine intro. Okay, let's maybe bring over some text. I'm just gonna, we're not going to spend a ton of time laying out these like content slides. We'll just imagine this is some like Alorum Ipsum text. Examine. Um, 
let's just say again, okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Examine page one. And the reason we're numbering this is because again, if we have time, we're going to make this a little bit more complex. Let's insert, insert this picture just so we know we're on the examine screen. Okay. So now I'm just going to duplicate this, examine, instead of examine intro, I'm going to be examine one of three. This one will be titled examine two of three, and we'll make a new one called examine three of three. So each, each one of these like scenes will have, sorry. this is, you would never want to do this in an actual learning project. We're not going to be putting page one or just like a random two. I should probably be, hmm, let me think, let me think. Well, I, I just want to do it in the heading so that it's pretty obvious to you what page we're on because not much will be changing. Okay, you'll see where I'm going with this eventually. But let's preview this and see what's going on. Well, one, one last thing. Let's make it so that on this last slide, when they try to go to the next slide, instead of just going to the next slide to nothing because there's nothing here, let's jump to slide home. Okay. So we're going to preview this now and see what happens. So if, again, just to reiterate what I did, on the, once you're on the last slide in this scene and you press next, you're going to be brought to the home, the home slide, which is that one that we created first. Okay, so let's preview this entire project. I'm pressing this preview drop down and entire project. Okay, so here we are. We're, we're not paying attention to this menu out here on the left. We're going to get rid of that. So select each button below to explore the content. Let's dive into this examine section. Here we are, we're on the first page of it. If I click this next button, we go to examine two, examine three. And then if we click it again, we are brought back to this menu. Now, the problem is, oh yeah, I forgot which one's already completed. They all look the same. Let's dive back into examine. So you see, we, that's, that's where this completion tracking is going to come in. We want to change something visually when someone views one of these, one of these scenes so that we can designate that to the, to the audience or to the user. Okay, so now we're going to get into some programming. So if anyone has questions about what we did so far, please add them to the chat. I see there's some authoring tool discussion. People are talking about variables in Captivate versus Storyline. I hear people say that Captivate can do some things that Storyline can't, but I've yet to see what that is. And Storyline, can ex you can execute JavaScript from Storyline, so you can do anything with variables you can possibly imagine because you have the full power of JavaScript behind you. All right. Um, someone's asking, what can we do to add the click slash layer smoother? I mean, we could add some transitions between these, between these slides. So for example, let's see. So I'm going to go to the transitions tab. And when we get to this first one, I want to, we're going to push in. So I'm on the transitions tab. I select the push transition. For effect options, I'm going to do from the right. I think that's the effect we're going for. And then if I go to the other ones in the scene, I want to push in from the bottom. I'll do that for this one as well. We will do push and we will do from the bottom. So let's preview this now. And for the home, let's, how do we want the home one to come in? Well, we, we, don't, we won't do it for the home because when someone first opens up the slide, well, let's just see how it looks. We'll see how it looks from the left. Okay, so let's check this out. I just added some transitions. I know I went through that pretty quickly, but if anyone is interested, we can break it down further. So here we go, we have our menu. Let's go into this examine content. It comes in from the right, so it's like we're moving forward. If we continue now, the next slide comes up from the bottom, so it's like we're just like going down the list of these, these slides in the scene. And now the menu should come back out from the left. Boop, there's the menu. So you see that's like um, an, a, a transition pattern I've used in the past that I, I, I think is kind of cool, but there are obviously many different transition options up here. So I, regretted, I regret my decision I made earlier to move all of this down because I think I want to have check marks come up beneath it. So once again, I'm selecting everything and I'm going to move it up a bit. Oh, I don't want that included.
And also what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that um, menu on the left. So I'm going to click on player here. And I'm going to just uncheck where it says menu. I don't need resources. I don't need the title. I don't need volume or captions. So I unchecked everything here. We will go to um, colors and effects. And I want this navigation, instead of it just being the icon, I want it to be icon and text. So now we can see these next and previous options. So I'm going to select OK. And also, I don't want there to be a previous button on the, on the home page or on the menu screen, or a next button for that matter. So I'm in the scene view. I'm clicking on the home um, button, the home slide, and I'm getting rid of all these next and previous buttons from it. So now when we preview this, you see we don't have a next button down here. We want people to actually click on these buttons to explore the content. All right. Where do you remove the ease in slash out on the transitions? Grant, um, you can control the transitions with the transitions tab up here. That's what, if that's what you're referring to. You can go back to none if you don't want to use whatever transition you are using. But okay, so let's dive into the programming. I think we've we've played around with this enough. We need a variable, or we are going to use a variable so that when someone completes, the, when someone views all three of these slides in this scene, we'll have a check mark appear beneath this examine button, for example. So, and there are a couple, we can also make it so that it has a gray back, background. So why don't we do that? That might be a better learning experience. So I'm going to ungroup this button right here. I'm going to select this rectangle, only the rectangle, and I'm going to go to this states panel. So if you're new to states, states are a way to add like different versions of that object. So right now you can see our initial state is normal. I'm going to select edit states and I'm going to add a viewed state. Okay, I don't, I try to avoid the built-in states because they're always, they wind up being kind of glitchy sometimes. So I always do custom states. So I'm creating a new state called viewed. I'm going to press add. So now you can see we have that viewed state selected. Any changes we make in here are only going to apply to that state. So I'm going to make it have a shape a shape fill and let's give it this like gray fill color. Okay, I don't think that's pronounced enough. So I'm going back in there and I'm going to try the next gray down. So now if you've already reviewed this, we can make it change so that it has this gray background. So that would signify to the user, this one has already been viewed. So we're gonna do this by changing the state of this. We can also do it with a check mark beneath the box. If you'd like, I can show you how to do both. Okay, looks like we're doing okay in the chat. So now we need to actually change that state once this scene has been viewed. So we need to create a variable for that, okay? So if you look on the right in the triggers panel, there's this little button called manage project variables. So I'm going to select that button. We have no variables yet. So I'm going to press this green um, plus button to create a new variable. So we want this variable to be tied to be titled is examine completed. Okay, because again, this scene is called examine. We want to know, is it completed? And that, that kind of naming format works great for true or false variables because it only can be one or the other. Either it is completed or it's not completed. So by default, of course, it will not be completed. So we'll make that default value false. Okay, and while we're here, I might as well just go ahead and copy and paste this two more times and we will name this variable for the other two scenes too. So um, is connect completed, and this one will be is explore completed. If anyone has any questions about that, let me know. And I don't use the built-in states because they don't always work as you would expect them to. They have like some default programming that they're using under the hood, and that programming might not always act as you intend for it to act. So when I build stuff in Storyline, I always just try to build everything from scratch so that I, to the extent that it's possible, I have, I have the programming work exactly as I intend it to work. So we're kind of building that out here. Yeah, Matt, Matt is um, adding some perspective there as well. That's good. But okay, so we have these three variables. Oh, and I see Anam is asking if we can show a check mark as well. So let's do that. Why not? 
So we have the variable now. Now the question to ask ourselves is since that variable is false by default, when are we going to change that completed variable to true? And as you can see, this would be a good place to do it when you get to the very last slide in this scene. So I'm going to go to the last slide and I'm going to create a new trigger so that whenever they land, whenever they land on this slide, I want to adjust a variable. So the action is adjust variable. And by default, I kind of filled this in. Adjust variable set is examined completed to value true. Yes, that's exactly what we want. When they get to the last slide in the scene, set the variable to true. So we don't want to do it when the user clicks anything. We want to do it when the timeline starts on this slide. So as soon as they get here, you know, we know that they went through all the slides. Then we can change that variable. Okay. So let me know if you have any questions about how we did that. But whenever they land on this slide, we're changing that variable. So I'll press OK, and there we have it. Now let's go back to this home screen. So now that variable changes from false to true, but we need to make sure that this thing has that gray fill changes to the viewed state whenever that variable is true. OK, so the way we're going to do this is with a trigger. So once again, we will create a new trigger. The action will be to change the state of, okay? So we want to change the state of rectangle one. If you are not naming things carefully, like I'm obviously not doing here, you can mouse over each one of these options and it will put a red outline around, around that object. So you can see this is the one we'd like. And we don't want to change that state to normal. We want to change the state to viewed. And yes, when the timeline starts on rectangle one, that works. So as soon as, that, as soon as that rectangle comes on the slide, it will change that state to viewed. But we don't want to do that just anytime someone gets to this slide. We need to add a condition. So we only want to change that state to viewed when the timeline starts if is examined completed is equal to true. So that condition is very important. Um, I see some I see a question from Elizabeth about if you can do the same thing with slide layers. I mean, yeah, this only all the this functionality relies only on variables and conditions and triggers. So it's up to you when you want to change those variables, right? It's up to you where you put those triggers. It can be on a layer. It can be when someone clicks something on a slide to mark it as complete. It doesn't have to be when the timeline starts on a slide. So that that trigger might look different depending on your project and your needs. But this, this is the functionality it relies on right here. OK, so let's check this out. Let's see how this is working. So we're going to preview this whole thing. Um, George is asking why the timeline of the rectangle as opposed to the timeline of the slide. You can do either one. It's, it should be the same exact thing here. I usually do do it based on the timeline of the slide because years ago I've had glitches doing it based on the timeline of the object. But I'm giving it another shot right now, so let's see how it works. So you can see this is the regular state. It's the normal state. And the reason for that is because when this timeline started, it checked to see if that variable was true or false. It saw that it was false because that's the default value. So it did not change the state of this to viewed. So let's click on this. We will go through here. Let's look at the different slides. So right, right now, right when we got to this slide, it changed that variable to true. So when we press next, as long as that, as that first slide resets to its initial state, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's see what it does by default. So there we go. It brings us back to that slide. It restarted the timeline. At the very beginning of that timeline, it said, OK, is that is examined completed variable equal to true? Yes, it is. So let's change the state of this rectangle to viewed. OK. So let's let's take a look at this. So I kind of took a gamble. Let me let me show you what I mean by that. So if you look down here in the bottom right, it says edit properties for a selected layer and we're editing properties for the base layer. So let's select that settings wheel. Now you can see this this setting right here is very important for you to be aware of and likely make use of. When we revisit this slide, by default it will always be automatically decide. So Storyline uses some of their built-in logic to decide, should we reset this slide to the initial state or should we resume its saved state? So if we had it as resume saved state, this wouldn't work. 
Okay, the reason for that is because when we first land on the slide, the timeline is going to run. It's going to be at a few seconds or maybe at the end before we select one of these buttons. Then when we get back to this slide and it tries to, it will never check this, it will never change the state because the timeline will not be starting again. The timeline only started the first time you landed here. So that's why we need to change this to reset to initial state because we want that timeline to restart every time someone lands on this slide so that these logic checks can fire, if that makes sense. And I know we're getting a little bit advanced, so if you are a beginner, don't worry. You know, you can always revisit this session, but I hope that this is helping connect the dots between, you know, helping you see how this programming is working. Matt is asking if I can show us the testing shortcut that shows the state of the variable. Sure, I can show that. And, but let's do a little bit more before we dive into that. So, and let's make this other point. So instead of making this when the timeline starts on rectangle one, we can do it when the timeline starts on this slide. Again, that's what I usually use, but the benefit of doing it based on the object is when you copy and paste that object, it would carry that trigger with it. Whereas if you do it based on the slide, it's no longer tied to that object. So if I copy and paste this hotspot, it will not be, or this um, trigger, it won't be tied. Well, never mind. sorry, I'm, I'm confusing people, I think so. But we covered that in the last um, Crowdcast session. Dorian's asking if there's a workaround if you need to resume safe state. Not that I know of. I think this kind of programming relies on resetting to initial state. What I, I mean, there are workarounds. What I've done is I've added a new layer. So like, for example, if you had all of this stuff animating in first and whenever they come back to it, you don't want them to animate in. What I've done for that before is I'll make a new layer that looks just like this layer, but doesn't have those like intro animations. And then I have a variable saying like, has, it, has the intro animation played already at least once? If so, then immediately show this layer when, um, when we get back to this slide. But I think that still depends on, yeah, we, we, it still depends on resetting to initial state on this base layer. So again, I'm sorry if we're losing anyone. People are asking some pretty specific and detailed questions, but um, I hope this is good. Cool, I see Ciara saying this has saved countless hours, hours of headaches, so that's cool. All right, so what, are, what did we want to see here? Okay, so we wanna add a check mark, let's do that. So we changed that to make it based on when the timeline starts. I'm just going to go to the insert tab. I'm going to select the icons option and let's look for check mark. So this is from the Articulate Storyline Asset Library. It's probably not gonna be the most on-brand thing for us here. I want one that's a bit more circular. It doesn't matter, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time with this. Let's just go with, with this here. Wow, this is a beautiful check mark, is it not? <laughs> Looks like uh, that's not gonna work out for us. So let's try a different one that isn't just a black circle. Okay, here we go. And what I want to do is I, oh God, okay. So let's make it appear beneath this once you've already viewed it. Let me see if I can maybe get some, keep it consistent with this height. Maybe that's too small actually. Yeah, let's just make it bigger. I'm gonna center this with the, I'm gonna select this rectangle and now select that. And then I'll go to the format tab and press this align center option to make sure that they're centered to each other. Probably move it a little bit closer. And I want this to be this, I I'm gonna grab a green from these illustrations. So let's go to shape, not shape fill, shape outline, because icons are considered as just like strokes. So we're using the shape outline. We'll use eyedropper and let's pull this nice. Okay, actually that wasn't true. Let's try shape fill. Okay, so sorry, that was wrong. And we, we do need to use shape fill to change the color of an icon here, at least for this one. And I, this might be a little, a little pale, so let's actually take this darker green. Okay, maybe this doesn't need to be so big. Yeah, this is, you know, you see me just playing around with this, trying to get it to look right. A lot of iteration. I don't, you can't just throw something on a page and hope for the best. Okay, this looks good enough for me. So again, we need to do states here because if we preview this by default, 
this is just going to appear appear here. Matt's asking me to explain why I changed the color and how I made that decision. Good question. Um, you know, when we think of green, we think of success, right? So this is a good time to use green because we've successfully completed this scene. So that's what like red would not be a good fit here, right? So green, you know, I'm, I'm using green for that reason. I think that's why Matt called that out. So that's good. So the initial state here, we do not want this to show by default. We want this to be hidden. Okay, okay, come on. Okay, so you, this is a joy of working with icons. This is being treated as two separate shapes. Do you see this? How are we gonna be able to do this nicely? So we can, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys a workaround. So what we could do is we could change we could try to use a trigger to change the state of these things from hidden to normal, but I'm going to do something a bit tricky and I hope that this all, this will show you, you can get creative sometimes. So I only wanna to have to change the state of one thing. So I'm going to insert a rectangle over this. So this is like a mask and I'm going to make it white and I'm going to get rid of the shape outline. Okay. So you see how I just, and these are not vectors. Storyline cannot work with vector graphics. Storyline can only work with like images. So I don't know what this is being treated as, or maybe it is being treated as a vector under the hood, but I don't think Storyline is gonna give us a good option to, let me see if I can do this. Change state of, yeah, this, I, oh wait. Yeah, see it's treated as two separate objects, freeform one and freeform two. We don't wanna do that. I want to use this. This is gonna be our mask and we want this to be normal by default, but watch what we're going to do. I'm going to create a new trigger so that when we're going to change the state of this of this mask rectangle to hidden. Okay, so hidden hidden is one of the default states that I will use. It just makes the thing disappear. So that that is the one default state I use, hidden and normal. So when the timeline starts on this slide, we'll stay with that. If so try to ask yourself when when do we want to change the state of this rectangle to hidden? And yeah, people are talking about ideas of how we can make this this icon work. There are ways we can do it, but I'm just showing you a very fast workaround. Yeah, we can we can try to ex we can try to just import an image file of a check mark. That's what I would probably do, but this works just fine, okay? So we're gonna hide this rectangle when the timeline starts if is explore completed is equal to true. No, when visited is false. We want to hide this this box so that you can see the check mark beneath it when that scene has been completed. So I, yeah, a lot of people are saying false. If we were changing the state of the check mark to normal, we would do that, oh no, that, we wouldn't do that when it's equal to false, when the value is true. So let's, let's, let's see this. Oh, and, and let's use Matt's suggestion too so that we can see this variable. So I'm gonna create a new text box and I'm gonna create a variable display. So is um, examine completed. So you see what I did here? I just, I used two of these um, percentage signs and inside of that, I typed the name of the variable spelled exactly as we have it in the variable manager. So I think we've done this at every single one of these workshops, but let me show you another way. You just create a text box, you go to the insert tab and then you select reference. And now you can um, select one of these variables and it will show the value of that variable on the screen. So this is a really good way to troubleshoot variable usage so that you can see what that variable is equal to on any given slide. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it on each slide in this experience. So now on every slide, we will see what that variable is equal to. So let's preview the entire project. Okay, so right now we can see that variable is equal to false. It's false by default. It's not gonna change to true until we get to the last slide of this examine scene. And, and you can see that that white rectangle, that is normal by default. So it's hiding the check mark so we don't think this is complete. Okay, so let's dive in here. It is still false. It is still false. And now it changes to true right when this timeline starts on this last slide in the scene. Okay, so when we go next, it will still be true and we should see that check mark and that changed state. Okay, so did I, did I get this wrong? What did I do here? Let's see. 
So it was equal to true, but this this box did not get hidden. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, no, that's good. Oh, I did it. If is explore completed is equal to true, but it needs to be if is, is examine completed is equal to true. So that was my fault. I just selected the wrong the wrong variable essentially. So let's go through this really quickly. So I, I, I fixed that variable. So now this variable is true. If we go next, there we have it. It's true. The state of this rectangle changes and that check mark appears because the box that was hiding it disappears. Okay, so let's try to just, um, we have some time left. I'm, I mean, let's watch how, e how quickly you can duplicate this now that we did it right for one scene. So I want to duplicate this scene. So I'm going to right click the whole scene and select duplicate. This one will be called connect. Um, so what I wanted to do, like why I had three slides here is because if we had time, we could have showed like how if you only view one or two slides and then go back to the menu, we, if we selected that screen again, we can be brought right back to where we left off. But it looks like we're not going to have time to dive into that here. And maybe we, maybe this is a waste. Maybe you guys don't need to see each of these items. And maybe like maybe once you see how to do it once it's pretty self-explanatory. Let's get rid of this variable reference. What I guess we can do is connect complete. Why not? I'll just do it for this second one so you can see how I'm just swapping these things out and how it's so much easier once you've done the programming once. So now on this slide, we're not changing is examine completed equal to true. We're changing is connect completed equal to true. Might as well change this as well just so so we can get a, a kind of a little cue of where we're at in this. So that's all we needed to do for this scene. Now we need to duplicate the programming. So let's, so let's try to use the format painter for this. So let me see if I remember it. Let's mouse over this. Double click this button to apply the same formatting to multiple places in the document. So I have this rectangle selected. I want to apply this viewed state to this rectangle over here, okay? So I'm with this rectangle selected, I'm going to double click the format painter. And now you see I have this like paintbrush icon. If I click on this icon or this rectangle, it should apply that viewed state that I made to this shape. So let's click it. And now let's go to states. And there we have it, you see? So I don't use that tool super often, but it is there and it is useful. It's called the format painter. So I, you can use that to just copy states from one place to another. Pretty cool little little trick. Okay, so now we need to actually change this state at the right time. So let's move this here. So we have these two, two triggers. So I'm just going to copy these and paste these because we need both of these. Well, let's, let's paste this. We need to add these as well. So we need to just copy this. So I'm gonna drag this over, hold down control, get rid of that, move that back over this. Okay, I need to actually cent I'm gonna center this check mark with this um, rectangle. And now I'm gonna I'm gonna align these two check marks to the bottom. So you see how I selected both of these? If I select this align bottom option, it will align whatever shape is further up to whatever shape is further down. So watch when I press that, it brings it right into alignment with that one over there. Let's move this rectangle over this. And now let's just change this programming for these triggers that I duplicated. So we're changing this state, not of rectangle one to view, to visit it or viewed, but rectangle two to viewed. And not when is examine completed is equal to true, but when is connect completed is equal to true. So rectangle four, we're not changing that one to hidden, we're changing rectangle five to hidden, the one beneath this connect box, when is connect completed is equal to true. And finally, the last thing we need to do is copy and paste this hotspot so that when someone selects this, it jumps to slide 3.1, which is the connect screen. And let's cover this back up. Where is that rectangle? Here it is. Okay, so let's check this out now. All right, here we are. So let's start with the connect scene. So false, false should change to true, and it does. So when we go next, here we go, we have that checked off. We can see it's complete. Now let's go into the examine scene. We'll continue through here. 
changes to true and it does. And there we go. Now we have this nice visual cue of where we're at in this experience, what we have left to complete. All right. So I'm going to close this. We'll see if we have any questions. I know it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. So let me stop sharing here. And yeah, how do we all feel about that? I see we have a question about if this is okay to put in your instructional design portfolio website. I think projects like this are a good way to show off your visual design skills and your storyline programming skills. But if, if all you have are short little things like this and you're not showing off any of your um, instructional design skills, like you know, make, turning complex subject matter into something more approachable or solving real knowledge and skill gaps with your skill set, then you, there's gonna be a big gap in your portfolio. So yeah, it's completely fine to include projects like this, but make sure that you also include those other types of projects as well. Unless you just want to be an e-learning developer, then stuff like this is fine. Irina, this will be a future book, Devlin's Guide to Life and Stuff in General. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. I'm glad to hear that this has been helpful for you all. Any other questions for me before we call it a day here? And again, this recording will be available. And I know if you're very new to Storyline, this is probably like what is going on, at least towards the second half of this. But I think it could be, if you are interested in knowing how to do this, like check out the, the replay and just take your time with it. Because if you can see why I'm doing everything I'm doing, uh, I think that would be a really good way to learn more about this. Uh, Anam, the recording will be available at this same link. And I'll put it on YouTube two weeks from now, if you prefer YouTube. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out who already knows how to do all of this stuff. I know you're just here to kind of help um, to help others. And Matt, thanks for helping me, calling me out and helping me talk more about pieces that would be helpful for people. Really good. All right, Dustin, I know you are very excited for that Adobe XD video. Um, I have to record it this month, so I'll... I'll, think, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it comes, but it might be the first week of April. <laughs> but stay tuned, Dustin. I know you've been waiting for that one. All right. Yep, the YouTube channel is Devlin Peck. So thanks, everyone. I'll, I'll be here in the chat for a minute to, to hang around and see if anyone else needs help. But um, yeah, thanks, and I'll see you. I'll do another session like this in a couple of weeks. So hopefully I'll see you all then. Bye-bye.